Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 412, featuring a review of the Bard's Tale for <laughs> Barrow's Deep. Wow, got the uh, collector's edition here. Been holding off on the review. I wanted to make sure I had this uh, so I could unbox it for you at the end of the video. Uh, full disclosure, uh, Brian Fargo is a big supporter of this show. Uh, he's, he's been with the show basically since the beginning. He's a fan of Dungeons and Desktops. He's actually an executive producer. He even sent me this beautiful uh, reliquary and in, in sort of a celebration or thanks, I guess, for my work on uh, the Bard's Tale series, uh, promoting that in the book and on uh, Matt Chat. You know, it's actually, I'm actually a fan of it, so it's not like he's uh, he needed to do this. Uh, but anyway, I just thought I'd put that out there just in case, uh, you know, you know, it's, it's a, a disclosure, right? Uh, anyway, I think you'll love this game. I'm certainly having a great time with it. So without further ado, here is the Bard's Tale 4, Barrow's Deep. And here we go, folks. The Bard's Tale 4, Barrow's Deep. Great, great game. I've been totally immersed in this thing. About 50 hours in so far, <laughs> not even done. I'm pre pretty sure there's at least another, at least another couple hours left. Uh, definitely worth the money. Have a lot of great things about it. It's got some problems we'll get into, but I uh, just kick back. Long ago, two gray gods crawled through a rift into this world and found it warm, lush, and unclaimed. It lacked only worshippers. So these gods, the Famhair, gifted apes with thought, shaping them into a clever, violent race, humanity. Great civilizations soon spread across the world, bloodthirsty, cruel, and strong in magic. Then the Famhair turned their greedy eyes on Arborea and Canestia, the homes of the elves and dwarfs, who until then had hardly noticed the thinking apes or their gods. Thus began the All War. As the elves and dwarfs banded together to defeat the Famhair and their human armies. But the Famhair were unkillable. All that could be done was drive them back through the rift. And even this cost the old races. All their gods and heroes died closing it. Worse, the farm here never stopped clawing at it from the void, rending the very fabric of the world. So, a song spell was made that would forever knit up the river. And as punishment for their part in the war, a human king's daughter was enchanted so she might sing the song without food or rest for eternity. A thousand years on, and the maiden is forgotten, but the whispers of the Famhair still invade the dreams of the ambitious, promising power and crimson glory. Three times have evil men heeded that siren call and sought the rift. And three times have they been defeated by ragtag and unproven heroes. Today the whispers wake a new evil. More devious than those that came before. Who this time will stand against it? What heroes this time will rise? Uh, so that's basically the setup, as we'll, we'll see. This is kind of like a, I don't know, kind of, kind of a Nazi-esque era of Scarabray. There's all these, uh, all this misinformation out there, all this uh, blatant racism, basically, genocide, what, whatever you want to call it, against the old races, the elves and the dwarves. And these uh, father rights may be having their strings pulled, as we saw there by these uh, evil gods. So there's, there's quite a bit going on. And it'd be our job, of course, to sort all this out. Ready? Not hardly. Hang it! Take it for the... Us, children, shall the sword father smite all who befriend the old races. Hail, Henry! 
So as you can see, they're not exactly subtle with the sort of Nazi references there. Hell, Hinrid. <laughs> Hell, Hitler. You know, pretty sure that's what they were going for. Uh, I gotta say though, this 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 opening bit, it's really not a very good representation of the of the rest of the game. I mean, you really think uh, <laughs> uh, after watching this intro that you're basically be uh, joining, signing up with Antifa or something. <laughs> Maybe this should be one of the classes, right? The the social justice warrior. Your bard could be a protest singer. <laughs> uh, fortunately, this is about as heavy-handed as it gets here with the, the sort of social justice themes, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I was a little worried going in that they may 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 have gone over the top here, beam dog style, or you know started trying to put in. A little too obvious of illusions as to what's going on politically right now, which I think would have been a bad mistake. But uh, don't I think basically the intro is a little bit misleading. I think in that regard. I, I don't understand. What did they do? What was their crime? Their crime. Existing was their crime. The fatherites don't like our kind. So as you can see, they're kind of going uh, for a, a sort of Scottish theme, this kind of a Braveheart style. What's, what I really noticed, though, is we'll get into, uh, they changed up the look of the elves and the dwarves and the trow, or basically hobbits or halflings, whatever. <laughs> and I'm really not really liking the, the new look. If you look at the opening little movie with the bard, uh, the packaging, you know, it's, it, it, Bard still, the, the original game seemed to have kind of standard fantasy characters uh, based, uh, I guess, on Tolkien or Dungeons and Dragons, and I'm perfectly fine with that. I think they went a little bit over the top here trying to make their uh, their dwarves and elves look different. They just kind of look like aliens or something. I mean, the dwarf doesn't even have a beard, even though he keeps mentioning beards. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you kind of wonder, like, what happened? With that, I really think that sometimes uh, less is more when it comes to changing from the uh, sort of stereotypical conventional fantasy themes. You know, I'm okay with a little bit of change, but it, it really just feels like Bioware and I guess now In Exile and all these other companies, they, they feel like they really have to make some radical difference, radical changes. They, they don't want to be accused of not being creative enough or, or whatever it is. And I really just wish they would just stick to what works. There's a reason <laughs> there's a reason those conventions swing a cat exist. In these days without hitting a paladin. Not that I'm prone to swing cats. So we're already getting away from that heavy handed tone and getting into more humorous what feels more like bird's tail to me. Check this uh, soup guy out. Delicious soup. Best soup you'll ever have. Come here for soup, have you? Well, soup is not an adequate description for what you'll be getting. You'll be getting fulfillment, joy, the tender embrace of your mother's arms. This is not just soup. It is a revelation, a liquid epiphany. Heaven by the spoonful. There is no question that this soup is good enough for you. The question you have to ask yourself is, am I good enough for this soup? Hmm. Uh, no. On consideration, you are not good enough for this soup. <laughs> this is a, Ruffians. a really great character. I think they said somewhere on one of the loading screens that you're never be good enough for the soup. And there we go. You could probably hear some of that music coming through. That's what this game is uh, especially known for. Let's see, I had the composers here handy. I'll see if I can bring that back up again. Yes, a game set to beautiful Gaelic music from Julie Fowlis. Fowlis? Multi-award winning Gaelic singer and Mark Morgan. And uh, I gotta tell you, man, they really just knocked the knocked it out the park with this music. Lyrics... I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just superb. I, I'm sure if you play this, if you like Gaelic music like I do, always got my uh, Pandora station tuned to it, uh, then you probably want to look for the soundtrack, get that downloaded. It's, it's really just some of the best uh, best stuff I've heard in that genre. And it really fits, too. And I think I heard Fargo say somewhere that, you know, a game called The Bard's Tale, the <laughs> Hello Bard <laughs> music, you know, music should play a big role. 
Well, it seems to be. Again, I'm not intimately familiar with all the original Bard's Tale games. I'm, I'm sorry to say I played the first one. Uh, but it really seems like they have beefed up the role of the Bard. You know, we've got uh, some really powerful things we can do in combat. And your main character, if you play with the default character, and really even if you create your own character, you'd probably want to make a Bard. All right, now we're going to get our first look at the characters we can recruit later on. There were more folk killed last night. Some great beast, they said. And again, they blame us for it. What I just saw at Hendred's Hanging Tree was the last straw. We have to... D do you hear that? The Song of the Maiden. What does it foretell this time? Arrest the heretics! Burn this den of evil to the ground! This way, hero! Hurry! Well, I guess it's the Night of the Long Knives here in Sanskrit Repray. I'm sorry, I'll cut it out. Okay, we can create a character and keep Melody. I recommend you keep Melody. She's an awesome character. Uh, but just to see what this looks like, let's go ahead and click on the Create option. Now, a lot of the complaints in the reviews were about how long the loading screens are. I'm just running this off my regular old-fashioned hard drive. I don't have a... <laughs> Check this guy out. I don't have the SSD going, but I think it's they've, they've sped it up in some of the patches. It's not too bad. There's a couple spots where it really seems to take forever. But, uh, you know, something like that doesn't really make or break a game, in my opinion. And there you can see we only got the four archetypes. And I imagine some old-school Bard's Tale fans are like, Where the hell's the hunter? Where's the, the rogue? Uh, well, the rogue's there. <laughs> Where's the monk? Where's the... Uh, the conjurer, the magician, the uh, what, the, what, what, the paladins. Uh, but really, what they've done here is they've they've kind of made those classes into specialties, I suppose. You, you can sort of pick out certain talents that would make you more like a monk or uh, uh, whatever it is you want to be. The the archmage is still around. That's what they call the practitioner. So they, they I don't know. I mean, it's different. Is it better? <laughs> I'll try to explore that question some more as we, as we go along here. There you can get a look at the races here. I guess the elf looks pretty normal. Uh, I don't know what the hell, hell's going on with the dwarf. Kind of disappointed by that, to be honest with you. Looks kind of like something out of a planescape. Uh, let's see. Got our Brian Fargo-looking bard going here. <laughs> you think they modeled him after Fargo? <laughs> and we get our first look at the talents. Or the skills, I suppose. And that little golden chain is kind of fun. That's how this game implements the Adventurer's Guild. So in the old games, if you remember, you had to go to the Adventurer's Guild every time you wanted to do a level up, and they would tell you how much, how many experience points you had left, and you could go there and, and qualify, basically. Or If you are a magic class, you could switch to one of your uh, specialties at that point. Change class, you know, go from wizard or sorcerer to wizard or, or <laughs> uh, conjurer to sorcerer something like that here we just have these golden chains so we'll have to do enough stuff do enough great deeds and eventually we'll get a mission to go to the adventurers guild and that'll unlock the next tier of that skill tree so i guess that's the big debate uh, that i would at least as far as i see it is to what extent have they simplified this versus streamlining it you know, I think most people are fine if you get rid of uh, redundancies or just needless complexity. Uh, but it is a, it's a different thing, though, if they're getting rid of cool stuff that uh, affects the gameplay. And I think where they... I'll show you when, once we get into combat, but I think one of the areas that I just... Okay, I'll just go ahead and lay it out. <laughs> uh, my three big complaints about this game. Just get those out of the way, because I don't want to spend the whole review fixated on it. Uh, but they, they limit you to these things they call masteries. Basically, your abilities, your, your cooldowns, actions you could take in combat. And they, they limit you to four of those. Now, apparently, they originally wanted to limit you to three. And the idea, kind of like with the World of Warcraft and their, uh, the talents, uh, they're always trying to force you into this, this mode where uh, you're, you're constantly switching talents around depending on the fight, the dungeon, the raid you're doing. 
And it seemed like they tried to do some of that here. Uh, so they're saying, oh, well, you should constantly be in there changing your masteries around. Uh, I just think it's garbage. Uh, you know, I would like to be able to use any of the abilities I've used. Just let me, leave it up to me. You know, they got the opportunity points in there. I could decide which ones to use, which ones not to use. Uh, if you're concerned about balancing, that's not a good way to, to do that. Uh, so that's one of my big biggest complaints. Uh, the other thing that just drives me insane is this save point system. You know, save points? <laughs> is this a console game? What, what the hell? Um, uh, but we do, we can only save at certain points. Actually, you could quit at any time and it'll save your location. Uh, so it's not that bad. But, uh, you know, if you're the kind of person that likes to save before a battle, normally you can do that just fine. But sometimes you can't. And if you, there's definitely a possibility of doing a whole bunch of stuff and not being able to come across a save totem, dying, and then reloading, uh, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes back. I mean, I don't know who thinks that's fun. And it has happened to me uh, with some of the bugs in the game. And people have exaggerated that. I think I've crashed. I had one really good uh, crash where I would, again, I had done a whole bunch of stuff, just crashed a desktop, and then I had to start over. <laughs> I had to refight a couple of fights and redo a really cumbersome uh, puzzle. I mean, it was fun the first time. I didn't want to do it again. Uh, so that that's a bad combination when you've got bugs in the game, but it won't let you just save it constantly. Because uh, that's what you kind of learned to do back in the 80s and 90s, right? With the, it's so, you know, you kind of expected the game to have some bugs, but you'd be able to save it and reload it uh, to get around a crash. Uh, that's not so much. Now, on the other hand, they do put lots of the save totems around. And once you kind of get familiar with it, you can remember where they are. And you, can, you can go back and, and save. But, again, you know, why do that? Uh, why not just let me save it wherever I want? Or at least uh, make that totem thing a hardcore mode. Okay, so we finally get a look here at the combat. And this one will be <laughs> a pushover. Uh, it's actually kind of surprising, though. Some of these early fights are some of the toughest in the game. Uh, not this one, obviously, but... Uh, coming up. I mean, it's quite easy to wipe your party. Uh, but anyway, my, my third big gripe, and again, I'm just trying to get these out of the way, <laughs> is the inventory system. And I got two problems with that. Uh, one is they've made the mistake, again, at least in my opinion, of uh, really limiting the, the gear slots you have. You know, you basically have armor. I mean, I don't want one. Look at this. I don't want one frickin' slot for armor. I mean, that thing ought to be, uh, <laughs> at least have, uh, pants, uh, bracers, you know, slots for rings, a necklace. You know, I don't know why these, uh, I don't know what the, why the heck these, uh, RPGs seem to be trying to make those, uh, limit the options and just make it like armor. <laughs> <laughs> weapon. <laughs> you almost feel like they must have been some pushback and they said, well, come on, we got to at least give them boots, <laughs> helmet. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just think, go to town with it, man. Oh, geez, give me the, the shoulders, the, the cloak, you know, etc. There's. I was joking around one time. I, I'm pretty sure I played a game at one point that let you have a different ring on every finger. <laughs> Maybe I just dreamed that because I haven't been able to find that game again. But, yeah, you know, it kind of makes sense. If you had a magic ring, you would freaking put that ring on, right? You wouldn't say, well, I don't wear a ring on that figure. You know, and I could see some stuff like, well, if you put gauntlets on, you can't wear rings over that. Uh, okay, maybe. Uh, but, yeah, I'm just not a big fan of this, uh, just limiting you to just armor. And the boots... I guess it's kind of interesting what they've done with this. That they didn't want to put stats on the boots. Instead, they want to basically affect, have some kind of effect on your, your movement in combat. And it does seem like they're trying to push you into this uh, moving around in battle. And a lot of the abilities that relate to that. So I guess that's kind of cool. Again, I don't see why you couldn't just stick some stats on that. You know, it's, it's just like they don't get 
the, uh, the one of the main things about these games is, is the loot. And if you limit the util, uh, utility or the variety of the, of the loot, you know, you really, uh, you don't do yourself any favors. And I, I don't think, I don't know what kind of a uh, player wouldn't like to have more equipment slots. You know, I don't really hear people complaining about that. I mean, you know, what really makes it bad is you get to a point where you basically don't need any gear and all the stuff just gets to be useless. It's cluttering up your inventory. Not much to look forward to. I mean, you might find a slightly better uh, set of armor, a slightly better weapon, but, uh, you know, in the old games, uh, there's just lots of more stuff you could find. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, <laughs> another one of my complaints. And then lastly, uh, with the loot system, it really needs, oh my god, does it ever need a, some kind of alto sort, or at least a little category option so you could... Just look at the uh, the weapons, uh, the, the ingredients. Uh, so that's out of the way. <laughs> uh, so those are my negatives. Uh, but there's a hell of a lot of positives here. Obviously, or I wouldn't have played this thing for 50 hours. I'm still kind of being obsessed with it. So let's get into what makes the game good. Now you're probably already starting to see this combat taking on some uh, some complexity. Uh, later on, I'll show you where I've got my full party, six characters, lots of stuff. So the, the combat definitely picks up, gets more interesting. Uh, there's different kinds of enemies that you have to implement different strategies for. Uh, so that's all cool. There's a lot of uh, uh, fun stuff they did around the, the turns and the rounds and the channeling. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, they've really just, uh, in my opinion, <laughs> I thought about turn-based combat and really try to think, you know, how can we keep this moving? How can we keep this from getting dull? You know, how can we build more gameplay mechanics around the idea of, of it being turn-based? Now, I think they've done a great job with that. And a lot of people agree with me, I noticed, on the, on the other reviews. Uh, one of the things that they've kept from the old Bard's Tale was the, uh, the idea of uh, giving your whole party orders and then the monsters take that turn, your party takes that their turn, uh, and then it comes back to you. So I was kind of wondering why they did why they went with that, because they could have just as easily gone with the uh, individual characters having initiative. Uh, instead of that, though, they, they put in this option, or this mechanic, where you have to click on the enemies before they spot you, so if you can sneak up on them. And uh, there's, there's not a crouch or a sneak command per se but if, if you just uh, come up behind them and click on them quick enough then you get first strike and that's usually what is that? pretty much essential because you don't want these uh, enemies getting the first attack uh, so let's see i just run up here charge then i get my guaranteed first strike uh, so that you know the positive side that is a little bit more fun i think because it gives you more incentive to uh, you know again be, be, try to spot the enemies and run up to them quickly and get that first strike uh, it does kind of uh, defeat the purpose of any sort of dexterity or initiative <laughs> check afterward. Uh, so it kind of puts it more in, more in your hands. Now, if you recall, the the old game just had that dexterity stat, and that's what determined who got to act first in combat. I'm thinking they were probably wondering what to do with this, since now you, instead of having just random monsters that you encounter that you don't actually see anywhere. Remember the old game, you just occasionally <laughs> so-and-so you has spotted you. Or, now the nomads are here, right? You didn't actually see the nomads in the hut until you encountered them. Uh, so here you can see them. So they might have been thinking, well, okay. <laughs> what can we do? <laughs> so I think this was a, a, a good way to go. Now you can see this fight's a little tougher. Uh, th these guys, and there's a couple monsters like this that are rear up and sort of channel, and you have to get out of their way before that completes or try to kill them. I was trying to kill it before it was able to pull it off, but <laughs> whoops. No good. So you see here I am. I've only got one page worth of equipment, and already I'm running into, uh, you know, I'm feeling that urge to sort. <laughs> sort, damn it, sort! <laughs> oh my god, how could they not have put that? You know, I think that should have been a stretch goal. <laughs> for another for another thousand dollars, you know, ten thousand, whatever, we'll we'll put in an auto sort. 
But you gotta hand it to them with the graphics, man. The uh, the, the audio visuals in this game are just really, really nice. We've got patrols looking for some Even this slum and the sort of underground Scarab Bray looks good, but man, later on in the game, I'll try to show you some of the some of the dungeons and some of the uh, the outdoor areas are just just absolutely beautiful, breathtaking, even. So they they really deserve some some kudos for that. I'm just gonna skip some of this stuff here now. Let's take a look at that thing in the back. Yeah, you see this thing. Yeah, what is it? I forget what they call it. <laughs> Pray to the Shrine of Michael Cranford. <laughs> uh, so you'll find these things here and there, and they, they give you a big boost to your experience. I'm kind of wondering if maybe you should wait till you have a, more people in your party. But I, I'm not usually that patient. Uh, so here we are in the Adventurer's Guild, the uh, old one. And this is really where the game will start. Properly start. Get our first mission. And hear from Rabbi a little bit. Now I am very sorry to say there's no uh, rats in the cellar here to fight. Matter of fact, there's no rats in the game. I guess I should make that my fourth. <laughs> That's the fatal flaw. Uh, but they did do some fun stuff with rats. And I'll probably show that to you later. Yeah, so it's not a complete loss. Well, let's uh, give Rabbi a listen. The Fatherites have decided to wipe us adventurers out once and for all. Not sure if they really think we're behind all the murder and mayhem that's been plaguing Scarabray, or if they just want a scapegoat. But either way, if we ever want to live in peace again, we have to prove to those bastard sword priests that we're not the enemy. And the best way to do that is to bring them the enemy. Now, I'm sending messengers to the elves and dwarves to petition their help in this. That help, however, may be long in coming. So we need a few brave souls here and now willing to hunt down whoever's behind this terror and deliver them to the priests. Not just to save Scarabray, not just to save the Adventurers Guild, but to save the lives of all the elves, dwarves, trow, adventurers, outcasts and practitioners of magic in Kaith. So, any volunteers? Well, you know where I'll be when you make up your mind. Ah, I knew you'd come forward, hero. Now, listen. Seems the raid on the Adventurer's Guild was just one attack among many today. There's atrocities happening all over Scarabray. And Dalgleish... Ringneck and the Green Lady, who you met during the fighting, have gone to look into some of them. I promised I'd send help if I could find any. Would you look for them and give them a hand? If you need some kit, peek in those crates. Won't do to go around defenseless in days like these. I already leveled up again. And that's one thing I do like about this game that I think they got right was the they put a whole bunch of levels in there, so it just seems like you're Every few battles, every few quests, you're, you're leveling up again. You're getting a new skill. And some of the skills pertain to things like equipment. So you could suddenly now you can wear chain mail. Whereas before you might might have been limited to, to leather. Uh, so that's really cool. There's always something to look forward to, some reason to, to level. You know, on the negative side, I suppose, it does make leveling up less big of a deal, right? Because it... Oh, there we go. I leveled up again. <laughs> now I've got to go back into that skill tree and pick a skill. Yeah, so I guess some people might not like it, uh, but I think it's pretty cool. And I like the the I like the idea that you're instead of just automatically getting skills when you level, uh, that you get to select them and sort of tailor your character a little bit more. Uh, so that's all pretty pretty cool. Plus, uh, they got some really good skills. Uh, so. That, again, that's some of the big strengths of the game is this this combat and the and the uh, and the leveling system. I just wish <laughs> they, I don't know who thought that uh, mastery thing was a good idea, but they, they should be one of the enemies that you get to fight in the game because <laughs> I mean, it just about ruins it. Uh, yeah, so that little thing there, the place in the elven weapon. Uh, there's there's all manner of puzzles. And shrines, and uh, just just cool stuff to do. And I, I really 
like the way that they set this up. So you don't necessarily know what any of this is uh, at first. They don't explain a lot of this to you. Which I think that's actually pretty cool because it gives you lots of uh, little things. There'll be all sorts of uh, barriers you won't be able to break open right away, zones you can't enter. And you can see that there's something cool back there, but you don't have the right ability yet to, to get in there. Uh, so they've done a great job with that. And, you know, in the Scarab Ray, there's all sorts of stuff here that you won't be able to get to right away. But you can come back later and do it. And this is why I keep coming back to Legend of Grimrock. I really think these uh, developers uh, were studying that Grimrock game. Yeah, this doesn't have the uh, grid-based movement, but it feels very much like that. There's a bunch of logic puzzles. Uh, there's there's little puzzles with fairies. <laughs> you almost have to, like, program the fairy to unlock things for you. Uh, there's all these little gear puzzles, and sliding block puzzles. And there's just a lot of uh, different kinds of puzzles, and even uh, riddles and things, which I love that stuff. You know, I'm, I'm a, probably about as much of an adventure game lover as a role-playing game fan so it really 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 works well for me uh that said though i can see where somebody coming from this from the older bard's tale games might feel like it's a little out of place i mean those games had puzzles too but not really i don't i don't think i think it's safe to say they didn't have this many or this much focus on it uh, so your mileage may vary on that but i think if you like the uh, grimrock games you'll like this and it's also fun to uh, explore this they do a really good job of hiding stuff little crates and barrels and uh, treasure chests and a lot of the times you'll be off just kind of exploring and you'll find a little nook a little cranny and you look at that and think man i wonder if i could get up there i wonder if i could f work my way over there somehow and a lot of the times uh, you get great treasures just hiding out in spots and you know i love that too so you really it really pays to take your time, explore an area completely, uh, make notes. You know, if you see a door that you can't open or there's, uh, uh, you know, those, those brambles across the path. You know, if you can remember where all that is later on when you get the abilities, you can come back and, and do it. All right, just about done on this, this character. Then I want to switch to one of my later parties. As you can see already getting some interesting options. I haven't even really talked about the Bard. I guess I should talk about him a little bit, how this works. So the Bard has to chug alcohol, and you can learn how to make different kinds of brew or buy different kinds of brew. Uh, brew. And they give you these drunk points and the spell points. And you need these uh, spell points to, get, uh, to sing songs or use your basically magical abilities. And again, you can do that just by chugging alcohol. Now, the practitioners of the magic classes, they have different ways. They can either meditate to try to build up points. Uh, they can, I think they get points uh, every turn or every round. They'll get a spell point. And the nice thing about it is they don't, when you cast a spell or use something that uses uh, spell points, you don't use up your opportunity points. So I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So when I charge these guys, I have a certain amount of little diamonds there. Let's see, where are they? There we go. So I've got those three diamonds at the bottom. That's my opportunity points. And some of these uh, abilities use them. Just about everything will use them. Some things will say it's free, doesn't use a point. And really a lot of the strategy is about managing that. Uh, like the trowel, for example. when they, If you let them make the final killing blow on somebody, they get their opportunity point back. Uh, which something like that, again, once you get where you're taking advantage of that, it makes combat a lot easier and also a lot more interesting. And of course, later, once you get some more skills and, and things going, you can get a lot more opportunity points uh, at, the, at the higher levels. I think I got something like seven or eight uh, in my other game I'll show you. And so that's really, really, really fun. And here's one of the cog puzzles. And these are still relatively simple at this point. Later on, though, there'll, there'll be little trap cogs that you have to be uh, careful with. And, man, there's all kinds of little lava puzzles, fairy puzzles. I, I'm kind of torn because I don't want to show you those because it would spoil it, the solutions for you. I'll try to show you just what it looks like, uh, but I don't want you to get spoilers in this video if I can help. Uh, here's old Ringneck. 
Now it is possible just to hire mercenaries. It starts off a little difficult to get the coins, but it's easy enough. But I think they did a good job with these characters. If I did a second playthrough, I might want to just create all mercenaries and just max everybody out. But then you'd miss out on some of the fun banter. Yeah, so there's Ringneck. He's, he'll be my rogue, the Trowel. And again, the cool thing about the Trowel that you don't want to forget about is that they get an opportunity point back for the party if they kill somebody. So that's a really fun mechanic that you don't want to forget about. And also, the uh, rogue has some fun abilities, like they can sense gold. A little gold sparkles will shine whenever I'm near a treasure chest. That actually comes in a lot more handy than you'd think. And of course they can also uh, uh, pick locks. You have to make the lock picks. And there's a couple of chests you have to have a master lock pick. Oddly enough, they don't have a mini game associated with the, uh, the treasure chest, even the locked ones. You just need the chest. I'm kind of glad for that, actually. I always thought it was a little bit lame. Uh, that you supposedly have all this skill as a rogue, but you're <laughs> you're still manually having to go in with some uh, mini game to try to get the chest open. I'm okay just to imagine my rogue doing that for me. Of course, you kind of have to wonder though. Uh, why can't you just let the rogue, <laughs> the wizards, uh, solve these cog gear puzzles for you or give you advice for this? the sliding puzzles? Uh, so I guess it doesn't all add up. So this is the trial's ability. So what? You see the little chalk signs, and if you look around, you'll see some sparkles on the ground. You run over there, and there'll be some a little chest for you. And the rogues, I guess any character can use them, but there are these things called call traps. And it's kind of a an AOE basically area of effect. You can hit a bunch of enemies with it. You do better if you can put it. If you can use it where they're going to step. So one strategy I found was to throw it in front of them and then use my taunt on my warrior to taunt them into it and make them walk across them. And that does a lot more damage. Uh, again, a lot of this game is about thinking about the next round or even two or three rounds ahead. Kind of like a game of chess. Which I love this stuff. Okay, I'm just going to play a little bit more to show you. I want to show you this, this uh, trow in action. And then I'll skip forward a bit. I, I do think, too, this game, uh, the first time I played this, I kind of had a couple of false starts. You know, I'd play for a little while, but I get, get kind of bored with it, uh, come back. But, but, man, there's certain, it's one of those games where there's a certain point where it just grabs you. And, unfortunately, that's not right at the beginning. At least not for me. It took, I guess once I got maybe about the three or four hours in, that's when it really started to open up, and I got really excited about it, and uh, knew I was going to uh, play it all the way through. But, there we go. <laughs> Why can't I kill you? Damn! Anyway, they should at least let you stomp on those, stomp on those things. Come on. Yeah, so this, uh, the trowel, he's been, a, oh, what happened there? Uh, this trial, everybody's being set up, right? They're trying to make the trial look bad, trying to make the dwarves look bad, the elves. And there's very, pretty cunning ways they've gone about it. All right, let's just take a look here at this, this combat. So some of the abilities will have uh, will affect different squares. And there's my hide and shadows. That's free. That's basically just a damage booster. Then I've got my call traps there I can throw. Let's see if I can... Hopefully one of those uh, enemies will walk across those. <laughs> you know, I probably didn't think this out too well, but yeah, the, <laughs> the archers probably aren't going to uh, decide to go waltzing across my call traps. So that probably wasn't the best plan. I don't have uh, anybody that can taunt at this point. My rogue there, he's got a little short bow he can use in addition to his uh, dagger. And one of the key things to consider... I keep saying that, I know. <laughs> There's a lot of key things to consider. Now, the different weapons you can find, it's not just about the stats, but they'll have uh, different 
enhancements for certain abilities. So you want to think if, if you really want, like to use the, uh, the Sword Barrage or Storm of Blades, you want to find a weapon that complements that. Uh, the, some of the swords actually let you swing a third time. So that makes that ability a lot more powerful. Now, sometimes it does suck when you have a, a great weapon that doesn't have that on it. I don't know if that's something they're going to uh, continue to refine or what. And also, some of the weapons have abilities on them. And that will automatically plug in for one of your masteries. So you might suddenly go back to like three masteries. And it's just because you have a weapon with a, uh, a mastery built, built into it, basically. So I'm not going to keep going on about that mastery system, but <laughs> yet again, <laughs> yeah, I just don't get it. Okay, and then we can make these uh, bombs and blow up uh, these little wooden railings. So I just, I just love this kind of stuff. And here we go. I'll do this fight. Now we're fighting the, the trowel. And <laughs> trowel on trowel. Violence. Yeah, I think this... I think that was really cool, the way they did the, the row. And if you get drunk enough, I think you get a double strength bonus, but then you're stunned for the next round. If your drunkenness exceeds your intelligence, which <laughs> happens to me in life quite often. I don't get the strength strength bonus, but... I get the stunned effect. Yeah, that was... Oh yeah, some of the combats too are coming waves. That's another nice uh, tactical element. So you might not want to blow everything on the first wave. But I like how it keeps my call traps. I wonder if it's going to actually uh, damage them though. Because I see what that trowel on the right looks like he's standing in them. I'll see if I can move over and make him. Have to come. Have to come to me. Come on. Okay, let's see what happens here. He's gonna cast his mind jab. That's pretty nasty. Uh, yep. Doesn't look like he took any damage. Uh, that kind of that must have been a little bit of an oversight, I suppose. He probably should have taken some damage when he walked across it. So there are little things like that, and I guess that's what these other reviewers are talking about. Uh, just little elements that probably should have been caught during uh, beta testing, play testing. You know, either make the call trap disappear after the first wave, or uh, you know, have them stay in effect. I guess they didn't want the new wave to be destroyed just by popping in right on top of them. Uh, <laughs> kind of like inside the game designer's head trying to figure out, like, well, what would I have done? Probably the easiest thing would have been just to make them disappear after the, the wave. Okay. Up against this magic user. Got him. Ah, that sweet XP. <laughs> Yeah, the, this is the trowel. I guess this is their take on a hobbit. See what I mean? It looks more like something out of Mass Effect. Pretty weird. Yeah, I'm not basically not happy with the trowels and the dwarf character models. And there's a little clue. <laughs> they must hate them! Ah, even more XP. Boom. <laughs> Alright, let's uh, switch over to some of my later game. Uh, so this one's probably a good 50 hours in. I'm trying to make my way into this castle. And I'm having to go through the sewers. And as you can see, this place is just teeming with traps and logic puzzles. I have to admit, this one I was not able to, uh, to figure out what the heck... <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I've missed a clue here somewhere. Sometimes if you look along the walls, and, uh, and there could be little messages, little clues hidden there. I didn't see any this time. Looks like that temporarily stops it, but then they all come back. <laughs> so, uh, fortunately, I don't, I don't have it at the maximum difficulty. Usually the traps aren't enough just to kill you outright. So you can kind of just... Uh, 
force your way through sometimes. Eat a bunch of vegetables. <laughs> Eat a bunch of food when you get done. So recover some health, but... I guess you're supposed to put it on the pause setting and then use that time to run through it really quick. You got me. I'm just going to have to uh, ex keep experimenting here and maybe just give, give up and make a run for it. That seemed like that sped it up. Okay, that sort of slowed it down. That seemed to make it even slower. <laughs> Okay, did that stop it? No. It's still going. It's like it changed direction. You know, now that I'm looking at this, there's probably a separate set of traps on the other side that also need to stop, but... I don't know. <laughs> just run for it. <laughs> Let's just make a break for it. Ah! <laughs> Oh crap! I didn't. It wasn't too bad. Oh god! Now here's one of these cog puzzles, and some of these you can't solve completely. What I want to try to do is make that red, that red dial, red cog stop, because that's the trap. So I'm basically trying to jam it up. As you can see, it's not going to be all that easy to do that, though. Some of these gears are connected. To try to find the right combination, but yeah, I'll just leave that for now. Oh, well, looks like we've got us a little Ready fight in there. So, do you want to fight first, or do you want to solve the puzzle first? Yeah, this has got to be getting close. This is where I like to call my wife in. <laughs> she, there we go. <laughs> uh, my wife Elizabeth loves these. Uh, these puzzles. She's really good at it. She gets a little OCD about it, though. I mean, she'll work on something like that for three hours. <laughs> so she'll be up all night working on it once she gets started. So I try to save that as a last resort. All right, I think I'm going to recover some health here, and then we'll fight this. Uh, was this an ogre, it said? You can see with having so many more party members makes the battles a lot more interesting. Now things get a lot more interesting when you have a full party, as you can see here. I've got, for one thing, I've got, a, I think, seven opportunity points. So if you really play your cards right, you can sometimes defeat all the monsters before they even get to move. Which is really cool. And I've got cool strategies I've worked out. I'm sure there's many more you could do, but... It's just kind of Matt's own little formula. I like to start off with that Fury song. That puts a little dot on them, so if they take any additional damage, there'll be a little bonus. They'll explode. <laughs> They're all glowing red right now. Hi. I think I've even buffed that up a little bit, that Fury song. Tell me what uh, that need. defensive stance, I forget what they call that one, the, yeah, the one right next to it. That's more effective than you'd think. Because every time a monster hits you, you hit back. If they hit two or three times, you can just about kill them. Combine that with the taunt, and you're doing pretty well. Mage just got this staff from Scorcher. <laughs> That's working out pretty good. So you see, a, there's those uh, furies kicking in. And I got a little bit more to play with here. I probably kill most things with my mage and my. My road more than anything else. Uh, the warrior on the right side, you know, the human, uh, she's got an ability where if you can get him down to 60 health, you can one shot him. Looks uh, like I might not, might not be able to finish these off. Tell me what you need. Okay, what's left here? Got a couple of. Kind of worried about that guy in the back corner there. Oh, no, no. Sounds like my sound recording's messed up a little bit here. Sorry about that. Okay, you think I'll I think I'll have to go one more round. This is passing slash. I'm not a huge fan of this move, but now what? It seems like you just about can't avoid it if you want to fight with swords. Don't know me. I'm not quite sure what I want to do with that last point. 
Yeah, I just passed it over. I don't think you get to conserve points, by the way. So if you don't use it, I'm pretty sure you just lose it. It's your command. Okay. Can I take this guy out or move away before he does his ability? Let's see, climb over this way. Right, just gotta get him down. Yep, there we go. Now I can just finish him off. Victory. Excellent. I'll just skip forward a bit. Having some kind of audio issues with the recording this time. I actually had to reshoot all this twice just because of a, another audio issue. So this is starting to seem like the curse of matchup. Anyway, I think this would be a pretty good battle uh, to end on. See, there's the, the priest from before. <laughs> Let's charge on in and see what we can do. <laughs> uh, this ought to be good. Probably going to have to pull out all the stops. In the name of the Reaver. I think my characters might be a little bit OP'd at this point. I've done just about every side quest. And, you know, imagine. Is that uh, Fury? Ready. I tell you, this is uh it's always exciting. I don't you know, I never went into battle thinking, oh god, another fight. Always was exciting. I think they did a great job here keeping the, the battles moving at a quick pace. A lot of effects, a lot of visuals going on. Yeah. Ready. I would like to have a, just a few more options on that mastery panel. But other than that, it works pretty well. It's a lot more fun, I think, than the uh, the original Bard Steel Combat, where you basically just said, <laughs> you know, fight, who do you want to fight, and cast a spell maybe, or hide in the shadows. With this, you get a lot more options. And I even like this better than the uh, Legend of Grimrock combat, which I'm not really sure there wasn't a whole lot to that. I've been trying to think of what other games have combat like this. No fantasy, I guess you could make a case for that. Maybe some of the JRPGs, but... You know, obviously Grimrock doesn't do this tactical mode. The Might Magic series didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Divinity Original Sin, completely different Order. style. Other than, I think they call these the Blobber games, right? Where you Ready don't you see are. your character. Your character's in first-person mode. So I think this I is a pretty good pretty good system here. Like you get the first-person exploration mode, and then this breaks out into this combat. Works pretty well for me. I like that they don't switch you to a different screen, either. You have to... The same background you were looking at just lays this grid out on top of it. Pretty well thought out. Oh, aren't down one character. <laughs> I might not make it. Let's have to see. But I'll just tell you this. I have a lot, a lot of fun with the combat in this game. Especially once you start getting some of the cooler abilities. Yeah, let's see if I can just... Get this guy down a little bit more. I can use her ability to, to kill him. Let's see. Let's see, this it's times like this where it gets interesting. <laughs> I want to be able to do it. Lots of opportunity points. I might be able to get him down low enough. It looks like I've got it. <laughs> Victory. Cool stuff. You shall never lead your flock astray again. You yeah, look at all these. <laughs> I wish I knew what the hell was going on you. with these runes. Must be some way you can turn off all these traps if you just knew what the hell you were doing. Anyway, let's uh, move on a little bit. I got a few other things I'd like to show you, and then we'll call it a day. So anyway, there you have it, folks. Bird's Tale 4, Barrows, Barrows Deep. Uh, what do I like about the game? I think it does a great job. Well, probably three things. Uh, audio visuals, spectacular. I mean, look at the scenery here. It just looks amazing. Uh, the music is fantastic. Probably some of the best music of, of any computer role-playing game ever. I mean, they really just nailed that. Uh, if you like logic puzzles, I happen to really, really enjoy them. Probably as much as I do combat. Uh, you'll find a lot to like here. 
Now, some people don't like the puzzles, so they did put a little walkthrough clue book of some sort. I didn't even look at it. None of these puzzles were so hard, I, could, I couldn't figure them out. <laughs> you know, worse comes to worse. Yo, Elizabeth! You know, come, come, come help me. <laughs> She's more than delighted to, uh, uh, to demonstrate her superior intellect and puzzle-solving ability. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, oh yeah, the, the combat, a lot of fun. Probably some of the best turn-based combat I've seen. Uh, it's kind of apples and oranges to compare it to something like Divinity Original Sin. You know, technically, yeah, they're both turn-based, but th this is a completely different system. Uh, this moves at a pretty rapid rapid clip. It you know, feels good, the audio-visuals, the animations, everything. It, it keeps it moving. Uh, I really like the fact that they don't bog it down with tedious animations and, uh, you know, long-winded cutscenes and that sort of thing. You know, this game, it keeps you focused where you want to be, exploring, solving puzzles, getting into combat. Uh, so, so all of those things, great. And it's a long, very, it's a, it's a long-ass game, man. I, like I said, something like 50 hours in, and there's, I'm pretty sure there's whole zones I haven't even opened up yet. Uh, it's a good, good variety of settings too. I didn't show some of the uh, some of the dungeons there, uh, but there's a lot of really fun sort of laser puzzles. What I, I think of them are lava puzzle, lava stream puzzles, <laughs> basically those circuit puzzles, uh, and other games. We're trying to get all the circuits lined up to get the flow going to the receptacles, and some of those even go up on the walls and even up on the ceilings. So it's it's pretty spectacular stuff. If, again, if you're in, into puzzles. Uh, the negatives, there's a few negatives. Uh, some of the stuff they will hopefully address in some kind of patch or future edition, director's cut, final cut, whatever. Uh, some of the, some little nitpicky stuff. I'd like to have this inventory system revamped. You know, put a, put a sort option on there, <laughs> for starters. Uh, yeah, just while I'm thinking about it there, some of the weapons you would think should be more powerful. So yeah, I keep finding all these elven, ancient elven weapons. Yes, it's really cool that you can uh, you can look at them, inspect them, find little mini puzzles on the weapon itself. Uh, they're pretty easy for the most part. Plugging in some uh, gems or seeds and solving a little uh, line puzzle. And then uh, you cap it off uh, by going to one of those elven shrines, putting the weapon in there for a final charge. Uh, but even after all that, the, they tend to suck. <laughs> or they don't tend to be as good as just their, their regular items, your weapons you already had. Uh, so that's a little bit lame. They should have, I guess, put fewer of those in there and just made them super powerful. Would have been mine. My recommendation for that. You probably saw me looking at a few other kinds of shrines. Uh, those actually use a code wheel. And if you have the box copy, it comes with a code wheel. But you can find a digital code wheel pretty easily. Just open that up in your Steam browser and do it that way. Or, or I guess you could even print it out and assemble it yourself if you want to. But Again, it's not. they didn't make it so that you have to use the code wheel. It's not copy protection, obviously. It's just something a little extra something in there for fun. Probably one of the biggest loot-related issues, other than just not enough equipment slots and inventory system. Uh, it's randomized to a point where sometimes you solve some puzzles, you find a key, you do all this stuff to get to the chest. It just turns out to have a couple of onions in it. <laughs> it's good. It seems very anticlimactic. Eventually get to the point where you're almost just... I can't do it. I have to get, open up every chest, and every barrel, box, whatever. But I could see where some people would just say, you know, it's probably just another onion. <laughs> some lame treasure. I'm not even going to bother uh, bother with it. So I think they probably should have put some more thought into that. What should I do? You know, maybe have some special items here and there. Instead of just making it so completely uh, random. Uh, crafting system. Yeah, nothing uh, utterly fantastic there, but it's certainly serviceable. Uh, they don't really have a priest class, per se, but you can talk to a priest to train and get some basic uh, cleric abilities. But didn't really find that super useful. Uh, in the combat, if your character dies, 
<laughs> it's not that big a deal as long as a couple people survive. It's all right. Maybe on maybe on the harder difficulty modes that would be more uh, of a necessity. Trying to heal up. Of course, you also have potions as well. So. Works out pretty well. So anyway, if they do make another cut of this, which I hope they will, or maybe even just patch this version, uh, please fix the inventory. That's the, that's the main thing. Uh, of course, keep working on those bugs. Uh, the little audio issues that you're hearing, by the way, if you're hearing those, that's just on my end on this uh, recording. I didn't hear it. It sounded great uh, when I was playing the game. Uh, other than that, I'm really, really enjoying this. I've probably got another two or three hours left, I hope before I put this game to rest. I'm already thinking about, like, next time I play, you know, how I might do it a little bit differently. I pick some different skills and things of that sort. Uh, so anyway, this is a game, if you like Legend of Grimrock, if you're a fan of those old Bard's Tale games and don't mind some significant changes to the format, uh, I think you'll really, really enjoy this. Got a lot going for it. Definitely got some negatives, but... You know, what, what game doesn't? It certainly doesn't deserve those uh, horrible reviews that I've seen in two or three places. I, I really think that's completely unfair. I mean, I would give this game either a four out of five or even a five out of five. And I'd probably push it towards a five out of five if they if they do uh, fix some of the problems. It's uh, really close to that. Um, I'll just go through my uh, the ratings really quick. Uh, the uh, Visuals, <clears throat> had no problem giving them a 5 out of 5. Everything looks fantastic. Just gorgeous scenery, great character models, animations. You know, obviously they didn't have the budget of a you know, Dragon Age or something like that. But, uh, you know, for what it is, they've really just done a fantastic job. I think they were using what, they, what the Unreal Engine for this, Unity. I don't know, not too uh, tech savvy in <laughs> the ways of a develop, game development engines, but just, just playing it, it looks fine. So five out of five. Uh, the music and the audio, the voice work, easily five out of five on that. Just fantastic music, great uh, acting, lots of fun banter amongst the characters. So I'd definitely go five out of five. The, the gameplay again, five out of five on that. It's really fun exploring. If you if you, if you like puzzles, uh, you will enjoy it. If you hate them, obviously your mileage may vary. Uh, but I go again five out of five on that. Uh, the story, you know, I'm not a guy that really gets off on game narratives and stories and games. You know, I, if I if I want to if I <laughs> if I want to read a story, I'll pick up a novel or I'll watch a movie. You know, I don't like games that just keep on with the cutscenes and endless dialogue. Uh, but that said, you know, it doesn't really intrude too much. It's, I, I think it's kind of ham-fisted at the beginning. You know, thankfully they didn't keep that uh, all that up throughout the game. <laughs> you feel like you're in the midst of some kind of uh, uh, civil rights game or something. I don't know what what they were doing if they wanted the game to be more culturally uh, culturally relevant or something. You know, <laughs> kind of gave off a vibe at the beginning that uh, goes away pretty quickly. You know, personally, I, I just think more games should just stick to the basic. You know, evil wizard. Eternal winter, <laughs> mad evil dragon conquering town. You know that's fine. You know hell, give me the, make it a prince and rescue the prince. <laughs> you know don't don't try to make it too uh, too edgy. Uh, we get enough of that. Just turn on the news, right? You can't you can't avoid it. Uh, so anyway, I'm glad they didn't it didn't keep that up. I hope it didn't turn off players. You saw all that at the beginning and thought, oh, oh, wow. <laughs> you, know, <what> have, <laughs> you know, what have I gotten myself into here? Anyway, once you get past that sort of introductory stuff, it kind of settles, settles down into pretty traditional fantasy tropes. And that's absolutely fine by me. You know, I haven't quite finished the game, so who knows? Maybe that comes back at the end with, <laughs> with major force. Uh, I don't know. And I mean, I don't really have a problem with it, obviously. I just know uh, a lot of people are tired of, of the politics and everything. You know, and, and, and the people that get off on that stuff, that, you know, praise games for the social justice themes and all that, there's no, they'll never be happy with, with anything, right? You're never going to make them happy. They'll just find some other aspect of the game that they think is racist, 
homophobic or whatever. And, you know, meanwhile, you've just alienated the, the people that probably would have loved your game. <laughs> so, you know, I just say, uh, hell, just stick to the tropes. Just have some fun. Not, every, not everything has to be deep and meaningful. You know, hell. But anyway, I don't want to get on too much of a soapbox about it. Uh, March Tale 4! Go grab it! Enjoy it! Savor it! <laughs> take your time with it! And let me know what you think. I gotta solve this damn cog puzzle! Freaking kills me! You might just have to be patient here. <laughs> I'm so, so oh my god! It's like a... Uh, there's gotta be some way. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? Ah, oh, man, it's like trying to drive a stick shift with like 15 gears and 17 clutches. <laughs> what? Okay, come on, man. You can do this here. Come on. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. You get a... Sometimes it helps just to walk away from it. It's just kind of clear the brain. Some fresh air. There we go. <laughs> okay, let's try this. Let's try this again, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Hmm, the little gray cells must work. I feel like I should get paid extra for this. <laughs> there better be something really great. Oh! <laughs> there we go. <laughs> ah. Now see, that's what I'm talking about, man. Yeah, it's a tough puzzle, but you solve that thing, you feel that little this rush will of... Be a challenge, my that little rush of endorphins. All is right with the world. You can indeed solve the puzzles plaguing, if not humanity, at least the gate separating you from those... Miscreants who are in dire need of a beatdown. <laughs> you come here, you. <laughs> oh, you're orange. Oh, I'm so scared. You're orange. And I've kicked Ready. red groups. Asses. Tell me what you show you, orange. These these guys are little bastards, man. They will just yes. keep summoning, 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 and summoning. Man, okay, I'm doing it again. I, I can't tear myself away from this damn thing. <laughs> what is this? Uh, anyway, folks, I am going to leave it here. Just trust me. Get the game. You'll like it. Goodbye. That's all for this week's episode, or this year's episode, feels like. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I'm going to try to get episodes out on a more regular basis. Uh, it's been really, really hellish around here with the, uh, uh, the increased <laughs> workload at school. It's just been insane. I've got like 60 emails uh, just waiting for me to get done here. Uh, so there's that. Uh, also, I've been working on my Dungeons & Desktops book with the Shane Stacks. And I'm happy to say it is done. It is at the publisher. <laughs> I, I'm still making a few little changes here and there, but it's, uh, for all intents and purposes, done for now. Uh, publisher obviously will be uh, doing the layouts on that, putting in the images, proofreading, and all that good stuff. So uh, I don't know exactly when it'll be out yet. I'll keep you posted on that. But anyway, it's been a long slog, and hopefully it will be worth it. 
Uh, as always, I want to thank you, 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 summoning, summoning. Thank you uh, for all of your work. I mean, for all of your help on this show. It uh, really means a lot to me, guys. You just you just have no idea uh, how hard it is sometimes to, you know, you got all this stuff going on and, and, and feel like, uh, well, you know, maybe I'm just too tired or something to, to, to mess with it. Uh, but then I remember that, you know, you guys really enjoy these videos. You like seeing them in your inbox. And, and uh, I like making people happy. So it kind of gives me that extra, you know, <laughs> extra push, I guess, uh, to get to work on the videos. So anyway, I just really, really appreciate your help. And if you, if you want to help, you can go to the Patreon site. If you want to see more videos, uh, you can certainly do that. You can go to the uh, Twitter to the Twitter, <laughs> either go to the Twitter, uh, go to the Facebook, uh, whatever it is you do. Uh, if you want to share uh, the links to the videos, tell people about it, uh, mention it on these uh, various forums. I, I see that and it really uh, makes my day to see somebody that is appreciating the show. Uh, so thank you very much for whatever you do to support Match Hat. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Uh, so what about that news for the Matt Cave? All right, so the first item here is uh, uh, something that is truly awesome. <laughs> I mean, uh, this just absolutely blew my mind. Uh, you might remember Michael Whitworth. I had him on the show, with him and his uh, brother Sam of uh, uh, Battlestar Galactica. A uh, big fan of uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, obviously. And uh, John Peterson as well, you probably know that name. Uh, if you have uh, done any sort of research into Dungeons and Dragons and the history of it and the, uh, the theory of it. But anyway, this is his latest project. It just came out as Art and Arcana, a visual history. And it's published by Wizards of the Coast. And I mean, first of all, this thing is, is massive. I mean, it feels like it weighs about 60 pounds. And it's all in just beautiful, gorgeous color. I mean, they go all out here. Just page after page after page of uh, really rare stuff. I don't know how well you'd be able to see this, but there's, you know, shots of the notes that Gygax and, and uh, his friends were taking. It's got all kinds of drafts, concept art, uh, personal information. Even got a picture here of the house uh, they were playing in. All of the rough drafts, uh, the you know, sort of old uh, character sheets. I mean, this is just absolutely amazing. It just goes on and on. I think there's something like, yeah, almost 500 pages in this thing. It's uh, it looks like it's 50 bucks. At least that's what it says here. You might be able to get uh, a deal on it. I don't know, uh, but I'll promise you this: if you like Dungeons and Dragons and you want the best ever <laughs> collectible uh, visual history, whatever you want to call it, uh, this is it. I mean, this is phenomenal. But but wait. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, oh my god, look at this, holy cow, this is a, I guess a collector's version of the <laughs> visual history, you know, this one is supposed to be definitive, and this one really does weigh about 100 pounds, I mean, you know, you could get a great bicep workout, just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, man, it's working for me, uh, anyway, this one's uh, Michael Whitworth, Kyle Newman, uh, John Peterson, Sam Whitworth, I guess it's the same, uh, project, but it's in an even better format. I mean, you open this thing up, it's got this, uh, this in here, it's just a little, uh, I guess a little bonus item. Open this up, I've got the Tomb of Horrors, original 1975 term tournament module by Gary Gygax. I mean, that's amazing. It's got all kinds of little uh, poster, little mini posters. Oh, wow, this is, that brings back some memories. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure how well this will show up on your end. And some of these are, are bigger prints. I mean, it's just art, art, art. Just a ton of art. I mean, you could decorate your whole house with this stuff. Absolutely amazing. And that's just part of the, uh, the bonus material here. You know, I know some of you folks are probably just salivating. <laughs> like, like this... Like, I know you want this, right? I mean, hell, just a, a, I'm just amazed. This is like a birthday slash Christmas slash uh, anniversary gift for me, all in one. 
you know, somebody that loves fantasy stuff, loves Dungeons and Dragons, loves uh, history. I mean, wow. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Then we get the special super version of the book, I suppose. Uh, alternative cover. I mean, just fantastic. Whoa. I've never seen that before. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm not going to show this page. Apparently, there's some kind of a racy stuff in Dungeons <laughs> and Dragons history. Was not uh, aware of that. Uh, you know, so I got a lot to learn myself. Oh, man. Just beautiful stuff. I mean, just about brings tears to my eyes to see this kind of love lavished on something. I mean, wow. This is just phenomenal stuff. I, I don't. Yeah, it looks like this big, this uh, big one here goes for $125, and I'm gonna tell you, man, be well worth it. No, that's a lot of money, but you know how often does something like this come along? And you're definitely going to want a copy of it. Uh, anyway, so thanks to uh, Mike and Sam and and uh, John and Kyle uh, for putting all this together, uh, sending it to me. Uh, I'm really excited. It really, just kind of made my day. Uh, I certainly want you guys to go check it out, too. I'm pretty sure you can get these uh, from Amazon. It's a, actually an official uh, Wizards of the Coast product. Uh, so anyway, congratulations, guys. Fantastic stuff. Uh, I know everybody here will be uh, thrilled with it. Okay, let's get this thing unboxed. And I am just awash with collectibles here. <laughs> Not that I am complaining. This is completely awesome. Okay, so we got the bard still here, the big... The big box. Go ahead and open it. See if I can. Might need to get a knife to open this with. There we go. Now it is worthless. <laughs> oh man, I guess uh, I know some of you guys are into like keeping stuff sealed, never opening it. Not me, man. <laughs> don't ever send me something if you don't want it open. Goes. I love to open it. Okay, opening it. Wow, look at this thing. It kind of, kind of just opens up. <laughs> <laughs> Even got the name of the game there printed. Now, what is this thing? Uh, not sure if this is a giant map or. Okay, it's kind of uh, gift wrapped. Ooh, oh. Whoa, we got the the code wheel. You know, I think I mentioned this. There's some spots in the game we actually can use this. Really nice code wheel. Never thought I'd be so happy to see a damn code wheel. <laughs> I used to hate these things. You know, they'd fall apart on you sometimes if you used it too much. Oh, now check this out. Deluxe soundtrack. Wow, it's a two-disc set of nothing, but, of nothing but music. Wow, that's fantastic. You know, this is actually a really nice thing, too, for this game. Because, I mean, it just got uh, off the top, off the chart uh, music. Let's see, what is this? DVD? Is this just the, uh... yeah, I guess this is the boot disc, they call it. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> it's so black. Well, then when you got the, uh, the, man the song book. Oh, well, what is this? What is this? Song book. Okay. I, what are these, like the, 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 the notes? The songs. Okay, we got, yeah, oh my God, it's actually got the, <laughs> Oh, I wish I don't know if you could see this or not. It's got like the the musical notation there, so you could play this on your your guitar, or your piano. Oh, hard working, the wand of peace. Oh, that is awesome. I've I've never seen something like this. That's that's incredible. Wow. <laughs> okay, here we have the uh, the manual. They just released this in a PDF format on on Steam. Yeah, so this is pretty much what you'd expect. Color, good job. Color manual, man, the spring. You know, I just, I, I sometimes just feel so sad that we're, you know, uh, when I was a kid, it was, it was kind of just expected that you'd have a nice manual with, with the game you purchased, and now it's like this super collectible, uber rare thing, right? But uh, certainly brings back some memories. Looks great. Now, what is this? The Art of Bard's Tale Four. Okay, so we have a nice little. Uh, Little art book. <laughs> yeah, and the game does have some some great art. Yeah, there's the the magic mouths. It's happy to see those. Yeah, the goblins. Yeah, it's all in here. I wonder if they have a giant rat for me. <laughs> oh man, good stuff. Okay. Now what is 
Holy cow, man, look at that thing. This is a, a cloth map, the land of Kaith. This is like heavy duty canvas, man. This isn't like that flimsy, thready, uh, threadbare, you know, wannabe cloth map. This thing is like a <laughs> place mat. <laughs> you can use this as a rug if you wanted to, man, and hold up. You know, Skyhedge Bridge, it's, it's all on there. Old Century Tower, Fetter, Fetter Cairn. This is quite nice, actually. A really nice uh, cloth map. Now, what is... <laughs> okay, so we got some graph paper. Uh, you probably won't be able to see that, but uh, I guess this is uh, for all the dungeons. Uh, nice sheet of graph paper. Well, there you go. I think there is an option to turn off the, uh, the auto map. Of course, I leave that sucker on. And here we have a... It looks like a cardboard spacer. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, wow, fantastic stuff. Yeah, I knew this was going to be some really, really nice collectibles in here. Uh, and they did not disappoint. I actually think I'll keep the, the code wheel out so I could use it for my game. Anyway, gorgeous, 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 gorgeous. This is going to look really, really nice. Uh, I had to find some way to position this next to my reliquary. But uh, anyway, wow, great job in exile. Packaging, game, everything, wonderful. Hope you guys can uh, get this too. I also just want to mention, if you want some more of me, uh, you can go to Fragments of Silicon. Adam Dayton and his friends there at the uh, Fragments of Silicon podcast did a fairly lengthy interview with me about Dungeons and Desktops 2.0. And we also talk about one of my favorite horror games, uh, Alone in the Dark. And it's a, I think you'll really enjoy the episode. I'll make sure to post a link to that in the show notes. <laughs> Wow, you know what I need? I am like the bard. I am ready to chug. My throat is dry. I am parched. Oh my God, what can you do when you're in that situation? There is one thing you can do. <laughs> now, I wanted to have a, a really, really special ale uh, for this. I mean, how often does a new Bard's Tale game come along, right? Uh, so I was looking for one that had kind of an appropriate theme, and I found this one by Surly. Uh, brewing company right out of Minnesota. They must have some hardcore fantasy fans there because uh, this one is awesome. It's got this really badass looking minotaur on the cover with a big <laughs> big honking axe. Uh, so I love that. Uh, it's a Russian imperial stout called Darkness. And I'm pretty sure I've had it before but not in this uh, format. Uh, let's see. King Minos of Crete, on the advice of the Oracle of Delphi, commissioned a labyrinth to hold the Minotaur, an unholy communion of man and beast. With the head of a bull and the body of man, it devoured any who dared enter his lair until Theseus, armed only with sword and string, slayed the Minotaur and escaped the maze. <laughs> that's a pretty cool myth. If you don't know about the string part, uh, that's that's a really cool thing. It's only been implemented in one uh, game that I'm aware of, an old Plato game. I had the whole string concept in there. Anyway, you, the modern-day Theseus, need only use wit and guile to obtain darkness. Our limited-release Russian imperial stout, the waves of coffee, chocolate, cherry, raisins, and toffee welcome, while the non-traditional dose of aromatic hops, surprise, and we can't stress this enough. Don't bring your sword to a liquor store. It's weird, dude. What? Don't bring your sword to a liquor store. It's weird, dude. Of course, yes, of course it's weird. You bring your axe, not a sword. What are they thinking? Uh, let's see. Omar Ansari, Jared Johnson, Ben Smith, head brewer. Uh, right out of, uh, let's see, Minneapolis in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. And they don't tell you what kind of alcohol percentages in this uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna take a wild guess i'm guessing it's pretty strong uh, anyway great write up love the uh, minotaur artwork I'll show you uh, that up close and uh, anyway though let's get it open and see what it's all about all right so i gotta try to get this thing open and i do have my uh, badass rambo 25th anniversary edition i mean this thing will cut you just if you look at it i mean it, it just cut my eye just looking at it uh, so anyway, razor sharp. Hopefully it will be able to penetrate this uh, maker's mark like... Oh yeah, it's going right through that. <laughs> that doesn't stand a chance. It's going to go right around the edge with it. 
You know, I love a nice collectible knife because uh, they're so functional. You know, I can't believe all, all this, uh, you know, animosity. It seems like knives are getting a bad rep these days, and people don't even want to carry a pocket knife anymore, <laughs> or a folder, as they say. I think I need a little bit more. But, you know, as somebody that likes watching those survival shows, and, you know, Bear Grylls, and, and uh, Les Stroud, and all that, to, you know, you really don't want to be out in the woods without a knife, because you can... Worst come to worst, you can use that for lots of survival applications, let me tell you. Even if it's just a humble pocket knife, it's a lot better than nothing. All right, I think I'm going to have to go for the bottle opener. Uh, this thing is really on there good. <laughs> uh, let me get my bottle opener. Be right back. All right, here we go, and I have my Predator bottle opener. There we go. So with the help of Rambo and Predator, <laughs> we were able to get this thing open. Uh, anyway, let's get this into a glass and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this surly darkness Russian Imperial Stout here in this rather excellent drinking horn. Uh, it just smells amazing. You really, really smell that uh, sort of a light coffee, very chocolatey aroma on this. Uh, it just smells really, really good. Uh, obviously, no f fumes or anything wonky coming off of this. Uh, it just smells great. So uh, let's give it a taste. Wow. And that is a, a really, really sweet. A lot of bourbon flavor, a lot of a, kind of a smoky flavor there at the end. Uh, a lot of cherry. Uh, but it's really got that nice uh, bourbon barrel kind of a uh, flavor to it. Really, really sweet. I mean, this is even sweeter than I than I thought it would be. Uh, very, very pleasant, smooth, uh, good, good consistency on this. Wow, this is just really, really good stuff. Uh, not bitter at all. Just kind of sweet, almost like a, you know, liquid uh, chocolate covered cherries is kind of what it tastes like to me. A little bit of a coffee. I think they mentioned toffee. I don't really taste any toffee, but I do kind of taste a coffee-like uh, flavor on this. I'm going to try it one more time. Yeah, uh, really delicious. A lot of uh, com complex flavors there. Uh, if you like the sort of cherry, chocolatey, coffee, sort of darker flavor, uh, sometimes they get a little carried away with these Russian Imperial Stouts and you know, the alcohol is too much, uh, frankly. Uh, this one, I don't really taste that. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's it's nice and smooth. Uh, got a very nice uh, finish on it. So I have absolutely no problem going a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, if you see, I, I don't know what kind of distribution they've got, but if you come across the Surly Darkness, I think you would uh, recognize this bottle. Uh, go ahead, pick it up. I think this one was 22 bucks. Uh, you know, it's a little bit on the high end uh, for beer, but you know what? Uh, <laughs> compared to like a... Uh, expensive wine, you know, this is uh, this is nothing. Uh, so anyway, five out of five on the Surly Brewing Darkness Russian Imperial Stout. I think you'll enjoy it. All right, so let's wrap it up with a quote. <laughs> I was looking uh, for quotes from Braveheart <laughs> for some reason, and I came across this one from William Wallace, and I think it kind of goes uh, with Bard's Tell Four, the kind of the theme of the game pretty well. Uh, anyway, see what you think. It goes something like this. There's a difference between us. You think the people of this country exist to provide you with position. I think your position exists to provide those people with freedom. And I go to make sure that they have it. So ponder on that and see you guys next time.
Almighty says this must be a fashionable fight. It's drawn the finest people.